Good evening, everyone. We welcome you all today from Bharat Nivas for today's talk under the series Spirit of Oroville. And for this evening, we have with us Deepika. And the topic for today's talk is Seeds of the Future, where Deepika will share about her journey. And of course, she'll be available to answer whatever questions if you have any. And to uh, coordinate this talk, we have with us B. And before we take more time, I request B to start with uh, introducing Deepika and to start with the talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shilpa. As, as you know, we have this uh, regular series going on every twice a month on Saturdays, but sometimes we have to do it on Friday or Thursday if there's another program. Um, today we are really uh, lucky to have Deepika because she normally speaks in Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta and these other places. And uh, many people in Oroville don't even know uh, of the extent of her work, you know, like she is, uh, you know, some people have heard of Wanda Shiva, but uh, Deepika does much more. Uh, she is pretty amazing. And uh, I was fortunate to uh, know them in the early years. And uh, she will explain to you a little bit about what they did, but very briefly, they took the worst possible land, which was uh, pebble soil, that's why their place is called Pebble Garden, it had been mined and they were taking the pebbles out. So they took the worst possible conditions and made it fertile and raised seeds on it, completely regenerated the whole place, the two of them. I mean, they did not have government grants or anything. A few volunteers came along and helped them over the years. So this is a story that you know should be known worldwide. She will become famous later, but right now, uh, Oravillians and all of us here are very lucky to that she takes the time to come into Oroville. And I mean, she lives in Oroville, but they live out uh, near Coot Road, so the farm is a little bit outside of the you know center area, so you don't see her very often. And uh, I'm so happy that, that she is here. And you see, the idea of the seeds of the future is obvious that our food security is threatened. So we live in a world that's falling apart now. The currencies are falling apart. There's still war. We know that economic troubles are coming. We know that the rupee has gone into the cloud. Many people don't know this but the rupee is now the e-rupee as of December 1st. First country in the world to digitalize the currency. So these are gonna have incredible economic repercussions and uh, we're gonna all have to be growing our brinzels and lady fingers in the backyard soon, maybe. So seeds of the future refer to that, of course, but also it's symbolic we have a future, we sow the seeds in consciousness. And so that whole food revolution is reflected in consciousness. We need the consciousness to understand without food, we're finished. And food drives the economy of the world. Many people don't know that. And we waste most of the food and we pollute most of the food. So all these things are happening. And she knows all about these things. So what we want to do now, we don't want to have a really a formal lecture, which she could do, but we want more of a conversation. So many of you are in that field, and many of you may want to ask her directly. So she's not, this is a conversation. So she'll say some things. If you have any question about it, you put up your hand, and uh, we, will, we will keep it as, informal and friendly as we can. She said she might get uh, pretty excited later and start yelling, but uh, I told her, don't worry, you know, these are all friendly people here. So, uh, Deepika, thank you so much for coming thank and taking the time. Me. Thank you for taking the time. And maybe you just start with telling us how you got into this whole story. 
what happened. A little bit about your background and why you're doing this. Yes. Um, well, first I want to thank you for calling me for this. And believe it or not, this is, I've been in Orwell for 29 years. And this is the first time I'm presenting something to the community. I've done it to small groups informally, but I never had an opportunity to talk about our work to the whole community. So it's a very special moment for me, historic moment, I would say. And uh, I'm thankful that you all came. Uh, thank you for coming because I was told that there are many parallel activities, uh, events. So you chose to come here and that's, uh, that's really uh, nice for me. Um, many things that we said, I, I can't live up to all the expectations you would have after hearing him. I lead a very, very simple, down-to-earth life at Pebble Garden and uh, I'm happy... Don't be fooled, don't be fooled. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I would actually like to, because many, some of you have come to my place, but uh, many of you haven't. And, uh, you know, s people know that, yeah, Deepika does something with seeds, you know. But what is that something with seeds? Uh, I think many people don't know. And sometimes people say, yeah, the seed-saving thing, you know. What is it about? Like, so there's some vague conception people don't really know. And uh, I would be happy if I could show you a bit of the work that I do. And then you please feel free to stop me anytime and ask me anything. Would that be OK? That is perfect. Yeah? Yeah. So uh, I hope I don't take time. But you see, when people ask me um, to talk about seeds, uh, I find I have a big difficulty. Because, you know, the seeds come from plants, and plants come from soil. And what do you do when you have uh, a background like this, you know? This is the nature of the land I work on. What you see, this is the context. The context of my seed work is totally different from any other agricultural context. So we have, you know, we are faced with a land that is so devastated that there is no soil. So we had to grow the soil before we could grow plants and before we could have the seeds. So I can never really talk about seeds without talking about how we built up the soil. So you will have to go through that whole story if you don't mind it, because you can't have seeds without soil. And you can't have soil without other things. So that's Pebble Garden. And for obvious reasons, you can see the pebbles. We are actually on a uh, on a strata that is from a river that flowed 20 million years ago and which has been exposed because of erosion. Uh, this is a picture from 1984 of the area that, uh, it's a big area in the picture, 8,000 hectares and it covers the uh, area between Tindivanam Road and Ustiri Lake. So, some of you might have seen it. Some of the early afforestation work was done. You can see a few bunch there. This was done by Peter Clarence Smith when he was in Orbrindavan. And uh, the uh, first attempts to regenerate this land were in 1984. This picture was taken from a, a tower. There was a microwave tower in Motarni. So I don't know who took this picture, either Bernard or Peter but climbed up on the tower and got this picture. So if you see this land, these, this thing, you know what this is? Well, it's this. So if you get into that crack, that's what it looks like. So this is a very familiar landscape of early Oroville because now it's all over covered with trees. We, we don't see it. It's not the stark reality. But this is the reality of Oroville. And this is the reality all of the pioneers had to face. So I'm not exactly an Oroville pioneer. When I came in 1994, Oroville was already developed. But uh, I'll, I'll maybe tell you a bit of the story that brought me here. I'm born and grown up in a city, cities all over India. So I was born in Bombay, I grew up in Delhi, and then was in Bangalore and Hyderabad and Pune metropolises. So as I grew up, I uh, I'm feeling uh, 
and I had the opportunity to travel to rural areas. My father used to take me to remote areas, you know, in the Himalayas. At that time, the Himalayas were very pristine, you know, when I was a young adult in my 20s. There were villages living with no contact with the outside world, no roads, and they lived with their agriculture, their uh, livestock. It was a fantastic life. And when I came back to the city, I saw the contrast, and I had, it left something in me, these uh, travels to the Himalayas. And I felt, this is the life, you know, what am I doing in the city? So I was pursuing a career, an academic career, heading to be join a university in archaeology when I felt that I didn't see myself uh, uh, in a city. And uh, I started, those were the beginning of uh, times when people questioned the idea of development. Because cities are places where, you know, the, you live in a kind of self-isolated, humans live like standalone species, and you feel that we can, uh, you know, live like that. And the, the kind of, a uh, mess that we create in the hinterland is completely invisible to our eyes. And as I traveled, I could increasingly see that and I could, I no more felt I belonged to a city and I had this feeling that I need to find something else to do. Uh, so at that was the time when uh, the book One Store Revolution came out and uh, my, you know, seeing the peasants, the life of peasants, uh, the, you know, the occupation of farming was very appealing to me, you know, and I really had a great longing that I should uh, do something that will serve nature, where humans are partners of nature and serve nature rather than be party to destroying it. And uh, this grew up in me and at one point when I, between uh, my, the age of 25 and 30, I broke my career, I brought the axe down on my career, I had no interest in a family life either, and I started from big zero. I had no idea. When I look back at it, I wonder how I had the courage to do that. Because those were not days when there was money around, you know. We, I had never had a job in my life. But I still somehow had a faith that I have to live my life differently, you know. <laughs> I was lucky to have a family which, uh, which was not utterly opposed to that. Like, my father was, is a unique person, he's still alive, he's 94, and uh, he used to say to me that money isn't everything in life, you know, go and dare to dream, like, travel, explore life. So we did it, you know, he told me to do it. <laughs> and uh, so then I landed up in Oroville with a real desperate desire to do something that will serve nature and to, uh, to, to be involved in essential things uh, to life, things that are essential to life. And that's how I landed up. I had no idea. I had this dream of farming and I had one store revolution in my bag. And I had my notes about farming and I had a, a, some seeds from Venkat. I don't know if you know Venkat. He's the person who started the permaculture movement in India. Uh, and he used to distribute seeds in beautiful handwritten packets. and. Uh, I had some of those seeds and I knew nothing, I knew nowhere, I didn't know where I was going, I didn't know what would happen. And somehow circumstances brought me to Oroville and it was the most magical thing, like all my four wishes, secret wishes were fulfilled. It was absolutely magical. So, but I had no idea, it wasn't a plan that I would work on this kind of a land. You know, I didn't decide that I want to take the most difficult challenge. I just wanted to grow food or be, you know, spin yarn or do plant trees or do anything essential, you know, to life. Because all our university education, you know, gives us degrees but doesn't teach us how to live. You know, we are absolute zeros when it comes to living. You just don't know the basics of life. You can't tell the difference between a tamarind tree and a palmyra tree, you know. The ignorance is so deep and yet the illusion that we know. So I came to re-educate re myself in these basics of life and I'm ever grateful that I came to Orville. So to come back to the story, uh, here circumstances brought me and uh, we started working on this piece of land. Uh, Oru Vrindavan is a part, Pebble Garden is a part of Oru Vrindavan and uh, this 
this kind of landscape is representative of almost one third of the whole country. Like if you see the figures here, we have 329 million hectares of land of which 146 is, 93 million hectares is eroded by water, <coughs> like this, canyon land. So it's quite a stunning uh, landscape. And I would like at this point to just uh, tell you a bit, because one question that occurs, you know, when you see landscapes like this, how did the land become like this, you know? This morning somebody said, how did it become like this when we showed the first picture? Is it, was it always like this? And uh, someone who visited us last week asked, she said that, oh, I thought it's the locals who cut all the trees and that's how it became like this. You know, so there isn't much of understanding of how the land became like this. And even though Pebble Garden is, you know, this is the pi picture of Pebble Garden area, and canyons are all over Oroville, but the whole of Oroville was basically uh, in an advanced state of desertification when Oroville started. Am I right about so, uh, that? I was camping in the desert. Yes. So an advanced state of desertification. So when we look at all the early pictures of Oroville, it looks, it's incredible, this transformation. And uh, once we started working on this place, it built up my, you know, this curiosity, more than curiosity, to find out how come the land became like this. So if you are okay with it, I would like to tell you a few little bits of information that I have collected over the years on how the land became like this. Are you okay with this? Yeah. All right. So in 1703, uh, Francois Martin, the first governor of Pondicherry, uh, came to build the town of Pondy, and he is known, this is recorded information, that he purchased the village of Kalapet from the Nawab who was ruling the area then. And the, the forests of Kalapet were well known for their mature teak and timber, uh, teak and rosewood. So they cut the trees of teak and rosewood to build the city of Pondicherry. And it's reported in the Gazette here that the canyons, this is the utility canyons in that area. This picture is from the utility canyon. Within 10 years of cutting the forest, the canyon started forming. That's one point that we have. Then uh, you might have heard of uh, Rangapile, who uh, was helping the French uh, in their, uh, you know, settling in Pondicherry. Rangapile left very detailed diaries of uh, all his daily interactions, and that is one of the prime sources of uh, reconstructing the history of Pondicherry, the French in uh, Pondicherry. So in his thing, he writes about the forests of Matu were destroyed for charcoal for the people of Pondicherry. Because wood and charcoal was the prime fuel, and if there was a trading station in Pondicherry, uh, they needed uh, fuel, and wood and charcoal was uh, the source of, the main source of fuel and the forests of Matur were cut for the charcoal of Pondicherry. And town of Matur is just up here, the village just next door. Yes. So I was trying to pick up bits of information which will help us understand how this <coughs> land became like this. I mean, why are we standing in a desert? Why are we standing on a, a 20 million year old riverbed? Because all the soil is washed out. There isn't any soil anymore. How did this massive degradation happen? And if it's happened on 93 million hectares in the whole country, we better be concerned about it, you know? What is the point in finding higher and higher tech solutions to produce more food when we let our soil wash away into the oceans, you know? So this was something which, so all food has to come from soil and we have to take care of it. So you asked me to talk about seeds, I have to talk about soil. Uh, well, that the seed thing will come later. But this was a stark reality we had to deal with, you know. How do we then produce? What, what is the meaning of that monster revolution in my bag when there is no soil, you know? And what is the use of the seeds in my yeah, hand? But tell them, tell them the one straw revolution is this book by Fukuoka, yes. a Japanese man who sold pesticides and fertilizers and saw he was destroying Japan. And he completely changed and started the one straw revolution in which natural farming and going back to the land happened. It's a wonderful book recommended to everyone. It was a really life-changing book for many people of my generation. 
So that was the beginning of the back to the land movement, I would say. Uh, and many people after reading that book were totally inspired and uh, quit careers. You know, a lot, a lot of courageous decisions were made uh, at that time because you have nothing with you and you are jumping into a big unknown. So, but it's still, and many of my friends, uh, you know, they've, We've all gone in different paths, and if they had continued, they would have been in America or some other place, you know. Uh, so, oh, yeah, so I told you about Mathur, and now uh, this coastline, the, it's called the Coromandel Coast, but I don't know if you know, we all learned a poem in school called the Coromandel Coast, so we all call it the Coromandel Coast, but it's called Coromandel because it comes from Chora Mandal. It was the coastline which was, uh, you know, uh, controlled the like a very vigorous uh, trade overseas trade was done by the Cholas, and Chola Mandal then became transformed to Coromandel. So there was a lot of trade on this uh, coastline from very ancient times. Even near Pondicherry, there's this place Arikamedu. During Roman times, there was there was a port there, and there are archaeological remains of an ancient port. This is third century BC, and. Um, so it's, people have been attracted to this coast because of the wealth. And all of the late, much later on, uh, the colonials, the, everybody, the Portuguese, the English, the Dutch, the Danes and the French, they all came to this coast. Of course, they came to Bengal first and they all came to this coast to seek a fortune. In the same way that all Indians now want to go to America to make a fortune, everybody came here to make a fortune. And people, you know, the agricultural wealth of the place was so uh, renowned and the, the handicrafts, the products that were made were so advanced and skilled that it was a very interesting place to visit. And so when the French and the Dutch came, French settled in Pondicherry, the English were in Madras, and that was called Fort St. George. And, um, and they were also in Kadalur, it was called Fort St. David. And the English and the French kept fighting. So each time the English would invade Pondicherry and when there would be wars in Europe, it would, it would you know, have a repercussion here. So Pondicherry would be invaded and all the houses would be razed to the ground. And it happened three times that everything was then demolished and taken to uh, Madras. So there is a very big environmental cost of war also. So each time the wood that was cut from Kalapet, they needed to cut wood somewhere else to rebuild Pondicherry. So the environment we cause to war, we can't ignore. And uh, the, the next thing that I would like to tell you is about this uh, steel factory. Uh, not many people have heard about it, and even I discovered it relatively recently. Uh, there's a place called Parangi Peta, 60 kilometers from here. It is uh, south of Kadalur, near Chidambaram. And um, uh, one uh, English civil servant who was in Fort St. George, uh, he wanted to invest money in starting a steel plant, a big steel plant. Because by that time, this was in the 1830s, by that time the English had, uh, you know, set their feet very strongly in the country and uh, they were not happy with the road, the movement of the road traffic because uh, of the mud roads, the bullock carts, hundreds of bullock carts plied on the main road in, near our place, you know back and forth and during monsoon everything came to a standstill. So that was not very, I mean they realized the potential of economic growth and development but uh, there were no means, transport was a big, uh, you know, it was a, a limitation and that's when they started thinking of the railways and that's when they needed steel and they needed more wood and the steel factory was started very interestingly it was based, the technology for the man, large scale manufacture of steel was based on traditional uh, steel manufacture, which very for a very long time it was done in a very small scale. Like I, I even got some pictures of conical kilns. So a little bit of ore would be collected, a few trees would be cut and very fine quality steel was produced in a you know, village cottage industry kind of a scale. So till the time things are made in that scale, there is no environmental impact because it's distributed all over the place and there's time for regeneration. And the, that, that's really remarkable, the quality of the steel. 
some of the world's finest steel, the, there was trade of steel from here to Arabia. Uh, Tipu Sultan's sword, the famous sword of Tipu Sultan was made with this steel. And uh, the Englishmen took some of the technology. I don't know anything much about metallurgy or things. It's just what I've read. Uh, he, he took some of the techniques and used it in this and then had a patent on it. And much later, the steel in England, uh, the Sheffield steel is still based on this. I mean, you can read up if you want more about it. But what happened? Do you see in the center of the furnace? So you need a huge amount of fuel. And, and they were given, he was given uh, permission to collect ore from a huge 98,000 acres of land in Salem. And the ore was sent by boats to this Parangipetre and, and Salem, Salem. Oh, Salem. Salem Hills. Yeah. yeah. And he was given a license to cut, to use firewood from the entire North and South Arcot district. So there was massive uh, deforestation because of the steel factory, and uh, but they produced the world's finest steel at that time for 30 years, from 18 around 1830 to 1860, and the steel was uh, in fact sent to Britain. All of India's and the British in British India and the steel in Britain, uh, all the needs were met by steel from Porto Novo. It was called Porto Novo Iron and Steel Works. That place was called Porto Novo before Portuguese world. But now it's called Parangi Pete. And uh, after 30 years, the company went under a loss. And uh, you can imagine why. They, they ran out of fuel. There was no fuel. So I personally, it's a hunch, I haven't got a proof of that. But I personally think that they kept going further and further away to, to get uh, firewood. And uh, then it got too expensive for them to manage and after 30 years the company had to close and what did they do then? Shifted it to some other place. So I heard one of the one thing is we shifted it to Tiruvannamalai which probably explains why the hill Arunachala was a desert during Ramana Maharshi's time and uh, but there's another uh, source of information which says we moved to the west coast and so this when basically with the colonial this colonial presence and the industrial revolution was the beginning of a, a phase in human history which hasn't ended after we got independence. I mean, it's not that after, after 1947 we reverted back to less devastating ways of living. It still continues. You know, it's just that, in fact, after all this, after the trees drastically reduced, the British themselves realized that they can't keep exploiting the wood so much. And so the idea of having reserve forest, you heard the word reserve, that started only after that when they realized that it has to be controlled, you know, but controlled for them. And there are many, many stories. On the whole, you can even, another small detail is that this area was, this district was called North and South Arcot. You're probably aware of that. And uh, our part actually comes from our card. Have you heard of that? Six forests. So there were six forests in this area. And none of which exist. There are only some place names here and there uh, which have the word card at the end of it. Like, uh, you know, Tiruvengadu. So there must have been forests there. 100% sure. Another detail is from the Irumbai temple. There are hymns. Uh, which were composed by Sambandar in the 6th century. In three of the hymns, he, he composed 11 hymns uh, about that temple. In three of the hymns, he talks about the trees. Right here in Irumbai, trees that touch the sky, so tall that touch the sky. And now, in fact, there's, people believe that the forest is, doesn't have tall trees. That's the kind of, because the four original forests are gone. There's a kind of belief that there are no tall trees in this forest type. So the, this in short, in brief is the uh, reasons, you know, we have to look at the uh, trade and uh, uh, commerce, the economy and the politics and wars to understand what was going on at that time. And 100% sure this affected the land really badly and uh, we lost our soil because of that. Um, 
and like I, I started asking myself, did it shock after independence? It didn't because instead of exploiting the, uh, the, the resources above the ground, we started exploiting the resources below the ground. So people started, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it, looking for underground coal. So the uh, navy lignite mines were found. And we, we mine everything from underground now. Petroleum, water, uh, coal, a whole lot of things are going from underground. So we have embraced an industrial mindset, a development uh, model, uh, which we, uh, we got from the West. And we haven't freed ourselves from that. So in fact, we haven't uh, won our real independence. We, we are still uh, a colony. And uh, we need to reflect on that. <laughs> and uh, it helps to uh, look at history because it helps us to move forward, at least give us a direction to move forward in a different way. And that's the reason why I, I, I'm interested to study these things. And I still keep doing it, but what I'm telling you now are based on things I've read. They may not be 100% accurate because it's not a scientific talk that I'm giving. It's just storytelling, but uh, all of these things I've come across. But I won't be able to tell you this page, this chapter and all that, unless I sit down and do that work. So that's the background to the work. And what we have in the end is land like this. You know, land that is considered unfit for growing anything. And when we started our friend, because Bernard was always in the organic movement, and uh, people would come and visit us and they would say, you can't grow anything here, you know? Why, why do you do this? And I really can't tell you why I do this. For me, I was just desperate to do any work that really matters, you know? And so we just did it. Okay. So our question was, is it possible to grow something on this land? And is it possible to bring back the trees that were here once, to reintroduce the trees? Is it ever possible to grow food on this kind of land? You know, that was, those were the questions I had, but there was a kind of a faith that we can do it. And especially Bernard, he already had experience. He, was, he came in 1975. And so he already knew how to work. And I just followed him, you know, and did what he told me to do. And so we have worked at Pebble Garden since 1994, and uh, we wanted to completely regenerate the place, have a uh, reintroduce the, for, uh, the tree species. At the same time, so many people in Oliver were doing the same work, you know. It was amazing because the stark reality of the land hits you. You have to do that. There's no choice. You can't think of doing anything else. And uh, so even though we never really interacted with, uh, and we are still not in the forest group, but you know, there's a kind of a connection, a subtle connection with everybody who wants to a different way of developing life, you know, a different view for the future. And we work with two conditions, not as if to make it more difficult for us. Uh, we said we want to regenerate this land, but we will not bring uh, inputs from outside. So we did not want to bring soil from outside, nor did we want to bring organic matter from outside, uh, for the simple reason that, you know, we don't want to make a desert somewhere else. Even our friend said, just bring two, three loads, lorry loads of good soil and start doing your work. But what are we doing to the other, to that land? So it's a kind of not a solution, it's just shifting the problem around. And if you look at it in the larger context of 93 million hectares, of where, where are you going to get 93 million hectares to shift that earth from, you know? So it doesn't make sense, we have to work differently. So no soil or no organic matter from outside. Organic matter for the same reason, because if we buy, if we have the power of money and we buy compost from a village person, what is he going to use on his land? So we are robbing the fertility of somebody else's land to uh, fix this one. So that didn't make any sense in the larger picture. And we also decided we want to do this work ourselves, two of us, Bernard and myself. Don't ask me why, okay? I have reasons, but you can ask me. <laughs> uh, and now I have to fast forward because I cannot tell you how we did it. Uh, that will take too long. Uh, but we have now on that land a regenerated forest. It's very, very interesting. The whole, the whole, you know, all these years. That's the reason why I'm not visible here, because we're so engrossed in this work. 
you know, we just we just don't have I won't say time, but we are just so engrossed, in it. and there's always so many interesting things to do and so much to learn and all that. So around six acres maybe, and uh, it's a very lush forest now, all on that pebble land. And there's even, yeah, so we have some really outstanding regeneration of very valuable tree species. So if any of you are interested in trees, please come. We'll be very happy to show you Like Pterocarpus centralinus has regener regenerates like a weed there. It's like, a, you know, we are standing on a real treasure. That place is amazing uh, in the way this tree is coming up. So this had nothing, absolutely nothing on it, this spot. And wildlife has returned now 29 years later. We have so many birds and bees. And last year, the forest, um, I mean, last year we noticed four new birds that we haven't seen before. This blue a flycatcher, the honey buzzard, and uh, what is that bird, Orochil? It's a cuckoo bird, the one on the right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, four new birds we saw, which and and another one of which the picture isn't here. It's a forest wagtail, which needs to hop in the understory. And this we saw last year for the first time. So everything is evolving. And after all, what is 30 years in the life of a forest which can be 1,000 years old, you know? 30 years is nothing. But still for us, that we could see in a lifetime such a dramatic transformation of the land is something. So now to come to the garden and the seeds, uh, we have a small garden area of 1,000 square meters. And we have also built up the soil on for that garden area with no external inputs. It sounds like a little bit, uh, you know, unbelievable, but there is a way to do it. And that is the, you know, this is the skill of people in Oroville to find new ways to do things, not new, things that haven't been done before, like uh, to work on something with your creative thing, be open to the, uh, to, you know, to nature showing us how to work. So there's nothing actually brilliant about this. We just observe how things happen in nature and we just imitated it. So those are the bets. And we, we did many things. But if you would like to know the whole story, you're most welcome on Saturday. Uh, the key part of our uh, the regeneration work is the use of pioneer vegetation. So we first grew pioneer plants, very hardy startup plants that have the capacity to colonize pebble land. And within three to four years, they produce a lot of biomass. And that can then be recycled in various ways to build up soil for the garden area or uh, to create a more favorable environment to plant the native trees. Because on that first picture that I showed you, a land which is just got scorching sun and just a tree here and there, no native tree will survive there. It needs a more favorable thing. A lot of knowledge has gone, a lot of experience in Orville in, in building this uh, I think it's a very valuable knowledge base because I think I've traveled to different parts of India and I have not seen uh, forests being developed, like entire ecosystem restoration happening like the way it's happened in Oroville. Like entire ecosystem region, which isn't just tree planting. People don't just plant trees here. They, you, you plant trees, shrubs, climbers, uh, herbaceous plants, you know, everything, all of that uh, is valuable. And it's a really unique body of knowledge and I'm, I'm not a great participant in that, but I'm very proud and happy that I could do a little bit at least in that area. So you can come on Saturdays, you're most welcome, 10.30. This morning we had a session. And we will explain you what we did, how we regenerated. You can see the land, see the soil, see the trees. Uh, that's Bernard. And uh, so we have 500 meters that I uh, uh, that is for seed conservation. And on this regenerated garden, I grow a lot of different. Instead of growing food for ourselves, I thought it's much more fulfilling to grow, uh, you know, seeds and share our garden with everyone. So I grow all kinds of different useful plants for home gardens, um, which includes like amazing traditional tubers, which have been sidelined after the potato was introduced. Uh, I, many garden fruits that are neglected, rare varieties of popular vegetables, 
uh, herbs, medicine, anything. All plants useful for home garden. Even broom grass is a very useful plant for a home garden. You know. So all of that. And um, we do at least 90 varieties. Actually, recently I counted 136 and uh, share these seeds in uh, farmers' meetings, farmers' fairs. It's all done in a very small scale in my house. There's nothing big about it. Uh, and I would like to at this point share one small thing with you, which I haven't told anyone till now. But I call my seed sharing initiative a garden for everyone. And I have a little pamphlet here, a few copies are here for you to take. And I got this name from the mother. Uh, she had, uh, in her early writings on Orville, she had expressed that uh, in Orville there should be a home and a garden for everyone. So I really, uh, I mean, it, I took that as something and uh, I have, I use it in this. this. This pamphlet is 15 years old but I still feel it is okay today. And the other thing is, these are the seed packets that I make. Uh, I can show you them in the... Yeah, I, I make, we multiply these seeds and um, I share them at meetings. So these are the packets. Only after I made it, I realized that it's very much like a blessing packet. <laughs> Isn't that? Yeah. In its size. And so I kept it like that. I said, I don't know what made me do it. I just did it like that. And then I realized that it's like a blessing packet. And indeed it is a blessing, you know. So I have a few seeds. You're most welcome to pick some up if you like. Um, yeah, this is the kind of uh, melas. We form the seed savers network. I travel uh, to different parts of India. And uh, it's a very, uh, very marvelous seed movement, seed revival. Um, uh, together with other seed savers, there's a really good energy. Now, I hope I'm not taking too long. See? No, no, keep going. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah, All right. Yeah. So, uh, I do these seeds and spread them, share them with farmers all over India. Uh, the thing which interests me the most is exploring diversity and actually knowing plants by growing them. That's what I like the most. That's what that's what keeps me in my garden and prevents me from coming out. You know, because I'm so busy. I, I just find it absolutely fantastic. And also the fact that you know, coming from a city here. Uh, we are totally disconnected from the world of plants. You know, we don't have that creative connection. We might have information about plants, you know, or we might have appreciation, but we are not connected to plants in the same way as farmers were when they domesticated plants, when they took something from the wild and made it uh, into a cultivated one. Just imagine the kind of, you know, uh, creativity or the kind of focus on that or the way in which uh, people developed all this diversity. So this, I will only take two examples to, uh, to, to dwell on this question of why does diversity matter? Like why do you need all this diversity? Why do you need all these different shaped things, you know, or different colored things? And why is it disappearing? Just two examples because otherwise it takes too long. And, okay. Uh, do you have any idea like what has this got to do with the subject? Yeah. Tell me. It's a gourd. Yeah, and a gourd is a vegetable, right? Is this okay? Okay? Yes. All right. So this, these, this is a royal instrument and uh, it's from the National Museum in Kolkata. It's a picture of a a vina from the uh, string instrument from the National Museum in Kolkata. You can see the gourd here very clearly. These are these are royal instruments more than 200 to 50 years old and they all come from a vegetable. Yeah, These are traditional bottle gourds from different parts of India. They are still used by tribals for different, uh, you know, in their everyday life. Uh, tribals still use it uh, for containers, for uh, carrying water as water bottles, that's why it's called a bottle gourd, and like this, and many musical and spoke instruments. So royal classical instruments, our sitar and our tampura, is made from a bottle gourd, uh, and uh, the the snake charmer pungi. Uh, this is you know what this is? 
is a bowl uh, thing. It's very interesting. This uh, this one is a iktara with made with a bottle hold. Uh, you know this accomplished artist from West Bengal, Parvati Bowl. We were very uh, lucky to uh, welcome her at Pebble Garden. She was very interested in the gourds that we were growing. And uh, she took some shells away and saying, I will reintroduce this among the bowl community and uh, I'll give these to my uh, instrument makers because this is the traditional uh, uh, gourd that was used in an iktara. Uh, this is a very interesting instrument which I recently came across. It's from the nomadic tribes of Telangana and it's, it's absolutely fantastic, the sound of this. Uh, you can check it out. Uh, there must be some recordings on the internet uh, and it's made from three different sized body holes. Uh, this is th the tarpa is another instrument, folk instrument from Maharashtra, from the Varlis and uh, I don't know if anyone knows about it but you must listen to this. Uh, it has a really magical, mystical sound and you know there are hardly any people keeping this tradition alive. There's hardly anyone who's keeping this. Then these, the, this person's name is Bitya Larkya Dinda and there's a very beautiful film, uh, you can get it on YouTube called The Tarpa Player. I, I recommend it to all of you to watch uh, because it's a very touching and moving thing and where he says my music is a gift from my land. You know, if we all have that same attitude that, you know, our lives are a gift from the land. And it's totally unreal to think that, uh, you know, the separation of us and the environment, that people feel that uh, human development is, is opposed to the natural development. Or if you work for nature, you're opposed to human development. I mean, unless we join the two, uh, I think we're not going to advance far in the future. We, sh we have to see the development of all. So, you see, traditional goats, they have a shell, which is 3 to 5 millimeters thick, and that's what makes them durable. But the sad part is, all of them are being replaced by this commercial variety. A commercial, you must have seen this bottle gourd, Loki, you grow it in our orchard. So all the traditional bottle gourds have been replaced by a modern variety, where the focus is only on yield, and nothing else. When there are 150 other uses for it, and all those varieties are getting extinct because this has been introduced and everybody just wants this. And it can be packed nicely in a box, in a crate, they're exactly 30 centimeters long and it fits very nicely in a crate, you can wrap it with newspaper, but if you have a bottle hood of that shape, how are you going to fit it in a box? So, you know, the future of our food is in our hands and if we allow it to be controlled by the seed and the agrochemical industry, you're going to get things which are bred for boxes and for everything else except for our stomach and our palate, you know. So it's up to us to preserve diversity if we, uh, if taste, nutrition, you know, uh, all these things are more important for us than, uh, you know, marketability and uh, transportability. It's, it's, it's our heritage and who said that they can't be productive, you know. It's really the productivity is something that uh, you can work on the soil, you can work with plants and you can always increase productivity. Although pr pure yield was never the uh, real emphasis for most traditional farming systems. It was climate adaptability that was the main thing that, uh, the main breeding priority. People needed varieties that could be grown in 2,500 uh, meters altitude, that could be grown on the uh, uh, below sea level. In Kutanad and Kerala, it is below sea level. They need paddy varieties which can tolerate salt tolerant varieties. You know, this kind of a thing uh, was more important for people than just yield. And in fact, all the modern varieties, uh, there's been an obsession for yield and none of this climate adaptability. If people start, you know, going local with seeds and save their own seeds, a plant is after all a living organism and it will adapt. But you have to keep saving your seeds and you have to develop plants, build a relationship with them. Interestingly, in this area, I found uh, there were eight varieties of paddy grown in this area, in South Arco. Eight varieties of paddy. 
and there were some varieties of paddy which were grown inside the tank beds. You know the system of irrigation tanks which is such a brilliant system of managing the water which made it possible for people in this dry area to live throughout the year with water. You know? And I think there are more than 150 tanks which ultimately drain into the Karaveli. 150 tanks with all interlinked, just imagine. And I read once about a British engineer who was sent uh, to survey this area uh, to improve the water situation and he came back saying, I can't. There is nothing we can do to improve the water situation. I can't find a single location where we can add another pond. You know? That was the brilliance and the way in which people manage water. The sad thing is that the entire system uh, is, has collapsed. It's totally gone. And when I recently went, I mean, you know, I don't know if people say it now, but when we used to meet each other, when it's raining, everybody asks, Mare Podma, isn't it? That's a question, no? And then the next question, when it rains more, then you say, no, Mare Podma, or Yeri Rombitta, isn't it? So now I went, I went last few years back, I met somebody in Kut Road, I said, Yeri Rombitta, and all that. They said, Yeri Rombitta, Yeri Rombitta, there are no lakes. They've all been built up, encroached, concreted. Why do we have floods in Bangalore City? Because all the lakes have been built up. So the whole system is collapsed. Either they've been built up or they've been silted up with all the soil from, you know, lands like ours. So that's the, sorry I keep digressing. Tra traditional snake gold is the second one I want to show you. Snake gold is like, the, the traditional ones were two meters long, but now they're breeding ones which are 30 centimeters. Do you get the long ones? You don't get long ones easily. Maybe a few people in order will grow them and we better continue doing that. But in the open market, you get only these, the small ones, because it can be put in a crate and because it's got a hard skin, it will not, uh, you know, it will not. Uh, there's a growing movement to uh, preserve and revive diversity. That is the uh, hope for the future. A large number of people and we created a seed saver network and many people are now do working with many different kinds of crops uh, and we are now in the second generation and there's a person in this picture, can you recognize him Bernard? I mean Bill. <laughs> well, that's Bernard. Yeah, but he doesn't want to be mentioned. He said, don't talk about me. <laughs> so, well, uh, in 1980s, Bernard had uh, started collecting traditional varieties of paddy uh, because uh, that was the beginning of the uh, Vandana Shiva's uh, you know, questioning the Green Revolution. And Bernard started was one of the pioneers to work with paddy varieties. You know about this. Yes, I know. Yeah. We went together. We had that first conference here. Yes. International. Yes, it was exactly in this place. I'm glad you mentioned it. Because that uh, that was called Arise, and you gave Arise. the name. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and one time Shiva came. Yeah. And many others. Many others. It was an outstanding meeting of, uh, and the first organic farmers network was started here in Orville, right here in this place. Yes. In this very spot. Wow. I remember the tree, and we had a tent all around, and Vandana Shiva came. And we also had a very distinguished uh, agronomist and soil biologist, Claude Bourguignon. Yeah. Yes. And he gave a marvelous talk, which I then uh, painstakingly transcribed. And that has been published in a book called Regenerating the Soil. It's really marvelous. But somewhere, the I think Joss had filmed the uh, whole meeting. And uh, that should be available somewhere. It was a fantastic talk. And it had, it really left, a, it sowed a seed in me because he talked about all the abuse of industrial agriculture, you know, and uh, how this can't go on. This is not food. This is, this is killing everything, you know. And uh, he said that we as a species, we need to redefine our relationship with the earth. That's what we have to do. We have to find ways of living which are harmonious and uh, I mean at every level I would say that's also what brought me to Orville as a personal quest 
you know, after all, what are we looking for when we say we want to work with nature, we want to serve nature? We are looking for a harmonious world, a harmonious planet, where we have harmony at all levels of existence, you know. And even personally, within ourselves, we want harmony within ourselves, we want it as a community between us as members of a community. We want it between us as a species and the whole uh, planet. We, that's what we want, that's what we are here in Norville, you know. And uh, I feel my work is a way uh, for me to explore that. And I think all of us are in the same, uh, same quest. So that was one wonderful thing. So Arise was a really nice gathering here. And that grew into the Organic Farming Association of India. And then it became many other things. Now there are a lot of young people uh, all over the, uh, in different states. Every state has a very dynamic seed revival movement. This is from Odisha. And uh, uh, is Dipti here? No, we had a seed festival in Mysore. This is the latest seed festival that I went to in Mysore in November. So the uh, youngsters in Tamil Nadu, uh, they have picked up this work really well and they have formed the Seed Savers Network. Uh, they are doing amazing work. They're all young people and these people are the future because all these young guys, they have they're all educated engineers, there's somebody who's an architect, somebody who's something else. They've all chosen to work on their farms. They all have not left, I mean, they, they're going against the tide, like against all the social pressure to be successful, to go into a city and, uh, you know, earn money. They're, they're staying on their land and making it work. They're incredibly dynamic people. So with that, I stop my thing, and I hope that we have some time for questions. We do. That's a, and thank you for so much. Arise. See, I'm glad I forgot that word. You know, that came from Vivekananda. He told India, you know, awake, arise. And arise was an acronym. Oroville International. Was, no, I'll tell you what it was. Okay. It was agricultural renewal in India for a sustainable environment. All right. <laughs> that was good. And what year was that? Do you remember? That was in 1995. 95. Yes. Yeah. It was an international first, and it happened in Oroville. Yeah. yeah. Thanks to Bernard and you guys, it was incredible. I think Oroville is a, was a hub of many, you know, really. Uh, pioneering things. It's a hub of many things in all fields. Like I think the first windmills were in media. Well, they took the Bangalore windmill that had uh, not worked in the village and uh, fixed it so it could. Hmm. Yeah, because it was not maintenance free. And hmm. then Robbie at Oreka, he, he did some modifications yeah. and, and now that it's swept all yes. over. Yeah. So many fields of uh, you know life. The biogas also. Kenzie did the biogas, yeah. we got the biogas going. Yeah. The solar was also very solar, early done here in Oregon. Barrel cement. Yeah. Everything. The farming, organic farming. And Bernard also, he doesn't want me to talk about this, but he was also uh, the first person to do Fukuoka style natural farming. And uh, yeah, he, pr he did it in Revelation and some very successful experiments and that. But he didn't, couldn't continue it for some reason, and that's why he doesn't want to talk about it. But, but uh, you know, we have Krishna who continues it, and he, he worships Fukuoka. Yes. If you go into, uh, into the Solitude Farm, there are stones with quotes from Fukuoka in the farm. Yes. And one of the most well-known quotes from Fukuoka's book, which, which actually is the one which touches you most, is that, you know, the... Uh, agriculture is not just the cultivation of crops, but the cultivation of perfect human beings. You know, and that's what gives it that depth and you know appeal that makes us want to do it. Yeah, that's that's the Oracle spirit. See, that's our series. We we want to revive that spirit. Yeah. Yes, in these times, we need it. But please, anybody, uh, we have an incredible resource here. So if you have any questions at all about these things, please feel free, feel free. Have you published anything on the history of this, of the... Ah, history.
history of the region, no? Yeah, I I haven't yet done it, but uh, I will need to sit down and do it maybe because it's a very interesting story. And each time I dip into all the journals and all, I just get I find more and more things. But you, I have I don't know. I I need to work in the garden every day. <laughs> And when I sit too much at the computer, <laughs> I, I don't feel good. So we can, I never can finish. We can get Aurora Eye films. Aurora will come there and, and, yeah. and do it. You know. Because it gives a historical background and it, you know, it, uh, it puts the uh, forest folk of Oroville in a totally different light, uh, which I think needs to be highlighted. You know? It needs to be highlighted. I would like to do that. I hope I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Could right. you speak briefly about how you regenerated the soil or actually created it again? Yeah. Well, you see, uh, when the pioneers came to Oroville, Bernard was one of them, and he was always involved in forest and farm, and people were looking for any kind of plant that could grow on a desert, you know? They were looking for, because nobody knew what was the original forest type. No one had that knowledge. It's all evolved by doing it. So they were looking for any trees that will grow. And they tried to collect seeds from the forest department, uh, you know, from KVKs and travel to different places. Everybody went cycling to the sacred groves around, you know, around temples. So they collected seeds. But they also collected they also realized that when you plant native trees on this totally harsh landscape, they didn't survive because a forest, Bernard always uses that phrase, a forest tree grows in a forest soil, you know, and we don't have that. So you need to create some more favorable condition. And so they started looking for desert plants that can colonize uh, this type of land without any effort. Like you just throw the seeds and they should come. We, you know, to eliminate the thing of making uh, nurseries and holes, you need to find some plant that you can throw the seeds and it will grow. And they had already got some Australian acacia. The work tree is one of them, but we, in our place, work tree didn't grow well. It was so stunted. It's only now, after 25 years, work tree is growing as a secondary species. <laughs> so, the pioneer plant was the other acacia, Acacia holosericea. With the silvery leaves, yeah, that was the pioneer plant together with two other shrubs, uh, Stylosanthus and uh, a plant called Virali, Dodonea. These are these three we broadcast them on the land. So uh, yeah, that was what we did in the beginning. In the meanwhile, we started planting live fences around, and it took three years for these pioneer plants to start growing and producing biomass. But tell them how you did those little ponds and then collected the silver yeah, yeah. each pond. But that has, so the pioneer plants took three years to grow and in three years they grow and produce uh, leaf litter which falls to the ground. And once the leaf litter falls to the ground, quite miraculously, the termites appear. And the termites, we notice they do this amazing thing of bringing the soil which is between the pebbles. So we have pebbles and laterite and between there is some clay. But it, we can't separate it, you know. It's not possible for us to physically separate it. But the termites are able to bring it grain by grain and they make a layer on top of the leaves. So you have, after the first rain, if you have, even if you leave a mat in the outside, you'll have termites over it. So they do all that job of bringing a whole layer of soil uh, in one night. So we have a layer of uh, leaves of acacia and it rains, then a layer of soil appears mir magically and then when it rains again, all that washes into the ponds. So we have 11 small water harvesting ponds, uh, which were holes that were made by people before we came to uh, take the, to use the pebbles, you know, they used it in concrete and for house fills and all that. So um, they, uh, there were these ponds which we a little bit enlarged. And so, in the natural flow of water, the uh, the termite brought earth, which is on top of the leaf, it goes into the ponds. And that whole process continues, and once a year, we could collect soil from the ponds. So we collected the silt from the ponds, 
and we collected the acacia leaves, we chopped the fresh leaves, dried them, and we made layered beds, uh, you know, alternate layers of leaves and silt, 24 or uh, 12 of each, and that's how we made those beds you saw in the picture. It's not a single load of compost have we brought from outside, nor a single load of soil. And tell them about the charcoal, how you add yeah. the charcoal. Yes. Charcoal is another thing that Bernard started uh, uh, researching in 2006. He read about terra preta, which is a soil of the uh, incredible soil of the Amazon, which is the only soil in the world that actually grows. Otherwise, oil soil, all soils keep depleting and eroding. And uh, so he read about this and saw a small film, a uh, documentary on terra preta. And the next day, he started making charcoal. <laughs> The next day, he said, I have to do this. So we already had acacia, and you know, we use the leaves for the soil building, the twigs we use on the sides, and the trunks of the acacia we uh, use for charcoal. And now, we initially, he made it in a very simple way, just make a pile like a bonfire, and after some point, when the flames start going up, you douse it with water and kind of suppress the thing, and that was a simple way of doing charcoal. But now we have a kiln. Uh, it's a Japanese model, Iwasaki kiln, and it's a very efficient way of making charcoal. So we are still busy, we still do that, and now we put it each time we, uh, you know, it's a new season, we take out the existing crop, the weeds, and we put a layer of charcoal, just slightly work it in, and cover it with mulch, and then we plant. But, but tell them what charcoal does, why you put the charcoal. Yeah, the charcoal is actually, uh, it's not a nutrient in itself. Because you know the charcoal, you can stay in uh, pieces of charcoal 10,000 years old, they don't, it doesn't decompose. It, uh, uh, it has this amazing internal structure, which is like, a, like you can compare it to a book, like a book is just that small, but if you lay out all the pages of the book, it would be huge. So the charcoal internally is something, uh, you know, very layered. And that, those layers, they help in um, absorbing nutrients and preserving it inside. So one of our big problems here and in many parts of the tropics is that whatever soil fertility uh, is built up, it gets leached away when it rains. And especially here we get this torrential rain, you know, like 1200 mm, sometimes we can get uh, one fourth of that annual rainfall in one day. Which is why once you cut the forests, your soil is gone. So the same thing for the fertility of agriculture soils, you lose everything. Either it leaches, you know, vertically or laterally. So the, the charcoal helps to preserve the nutrients in its structure. And then the plants can absorb those nutrients after the monsoon when the sun shines and photosynthesis uh, starts again. So this is actually Bernard's research. I mean, he should be telling you about it. <laughs> But uh, you're welcome to come and see and uh, ask him all your questions. Uh, he'll be very happy to show you. On Tuesday, we are going to uh, fire the kiln. So we do that regularly. Then we crush the charcoal after we, we, we split the wood into a certain size for the kiln. And then it's crushed and we mix it with urine. We mix it with our own urine because we don't have cattle. And all our work has is, is got no animal manure. It's only leafy and organic biomass. So, yeah. That was quite uh, something. We have another participant. <laughs> so that's the story of charcoal. Anything else? <laughs> uh, thank you, Lipika. Uh, here I am. Yeah. Uh, thank you for sharing your journey. Yeah, it, it has been almost uh, three decades, you know, for you. And uh, uh, whatever you have shared, it, it looks like a very rosy picture. <laughs> but in these three decades, uh, what kind of challenges you have been come across? And uh, was uh, like nature was it always helpful to you in in, in achieving your your endeavor, or was there any challenges? And apart from the nature, there might be uh, some human factors which is always involved. So could you please share something on that and how you have been, you know, uh, 
how you have been overcoming those challenges and what was your mindset throughout the journey? Or, or was it always uh, the graph was going up? Thank you. Mm, well, I have to say that, I mean, it is it has never been easy. It was not an easy work, but we were never discouraged by the hardships. Somehow, it never, even now, I fail many more times than I succeed. I have to be honest with you. People say, oh, you must have a green thumb, but I really don't have a green thumb. I fail many, many times. In fact, I, have a, I feel I have a green fist <laughs> because I don't give up, you know. And if you fail two or three times, so how long are you going to fail? You have to succeed at some point if you keep doing it. <laughs> some point you have to succeed. It can't just go on like that, you know, like that. It has to come up. So I don't know how we, we just have the ability to uh, cope with this. And uh, I never saw it as really a hardship. So. And we always felt encouraged, actually. Like the way in which the life starts coming back, it's not that we saw uh, a result only now after 30 years. Very quickly, we saw some things happening. But we didn't have any dream of like some paradise, you know. We were just looking at our next steps. Like if something we planted has made one new leaf, wow, that's an achievement, you know. And secondly, when this year has become that big, we only looked at that and that's what kept us going. You, you can't look too far. You look at your next steps and then all of a sudden, actually five years back, we noticed a dramatic change in the whole place. Uh, only five years back. Before that, you know, I couldn't grow anything outside the garden area. Like, uh, I had brought fodder grasses from a farm to for biomass. I could I had to plant it inside the garden area because I can't plant anything on the pebbles. But five years back, the surrounding the, around the garden area it started improving, and now grass is coming up everywhere, and now things are changing. So there's an overall improvement of the whole situation now. But I never, uh, in fact, you know, people ask how long it took. So. I would say we started three years to establish the pioneer vegetation and then three months to make the beds, you know. In three years and three months, you already can grow some things. You can have a garden and you can grow some things. It's not that long at all, mm -hmm. you know. So I never felt discouraged by hardship. We have, you know, now like everybody, we have a forest area and the wildlife uh, returning was a very big event, you know. When I saw the first porcupine quill, I was elated until it started attacking my garden. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so now that is a challenge, how to coexist with this. And, uh, you know, we are, we are not, if we are hunters and gatherers, then I guess there could be a balance in that, but we are not. So uh, I had to make a fence around the garden. Then we have the peacocks. And uh, yeah, we have all these challenges. But even then, I, I don't know, I always felt supported and guided and I never feel let down, uh, never felt let down. There is some presence which keeps us going and there is some energy which, uh, which keeps us, uh, you know. Uh, ultimately, you know, the feeling when you, I think it's for everyone, when you do a work which you feel you're here to do that work, you feel energized by it, you know. And Initially, there were some moments when I felt, you know, how difficult it is to grow things on this land. But I'm put in this situation. I wanted to grow, right? I wanted to be a farmer and I'm in this really tough thing. How difficult it is to grow things. And yes, I did uh, feel uh, sometimes like, what am I doing? Like, it's so difficult, like, you know? Because others tell you that, you know? It wasn't personally a discouragement. And, um, but then after some time, the challenge actually fuels you. It, it encourages you more. Because it's difficult, you know, you get some extra uh, energy to work. The challenge becomes a uh, propels you to do more. And I think uh, I still work in that way. Yeah. Talk about the seed exchanges. And I'm wondering that are the seeds quite interchangeable between states, for example, to Kerala, would they grow and well there? Because I was, and I think the reason why I'm asking is I came from Kerala, so everything looked very lush and green. 
But do you still think it's all the vegetables from Tamil Nadu? Which surprised me because Tamil Nadu is such a dry state. And I was wondering if you could say something. And because if these grow so, we have such a lush place. Kerala seems like it has very good soil. Why wouldn't they be growing this? And maybe that's not a, you know, a question for you, but if you could. No, it's a, it's a good question. The, the, the thing with Kerala, it rains a lot. Like three meters or four meters, I don't know who's from Kerala here, but uh, it rains enormously. So people think that uh, heavy, like you get all this rainfall, and what a blessing. They, they say the same for us. Like people say, oh, you get 1,200 mm rainfall. I say, do you know that sometimes one fourth of it falls in one day? <laughs> yeah, and do you know how much, what we can lose by that? Like you don't have tree, you can see the canyons forming in front of your eyes if you go out, you know. If you don't have trees or grass cover and all, it's very damaging. So Kerala probably has a difficulty with uh, excess rain, but also they have uh, trouble with labor because it's very expensive. So farming is unfeasible and uh, most many of them go to foreign countries. The same like in Punjab, you know, it's labor is the highest in Kerala, I was told. It's very hard to do farming uh, over there. But about your question about the varieties, uh, you're right about this. The origin in traditional agriculture, the whole of the country was a seed bank. You know, every farmer's field was a seed garden, and every farmer's house was a seed center. You know, so diversity was spread throughout the country in such amazing diverse locations. You, know, it's unbelievable. And for every region, there were specific crops. Like even so specific, like in hilly areas, if you have a village on that side of the valley, it's a different variety from this side of the valley because your sun will be different, you know. And so variety was so specifically adapted to those locations, but all of that got disturbed with industrial agriculture, with this thing that yields have to increase, you know, with this emphasis on yields and productivity, all in fertile areas, and uh, you know, kind of making all these uh, remote areas, the farmers from these areas feel that they are primitive. So I've been, I've had the opportunity to travel in tribal areas in Orissa. They grow, you know, on hilly slopes, 54 crops on the slopes at one time. They have a mix of 54 seeds and they broadcast it all at one time. From the 40th day onwards, they start harvesting something or the other. 40 days, then another one week and another one week. And that harvesting goes on for six months. That is called primitive. <laughs> so what do you do? So, so those varieties were suited for their land. And you're right that if, we, if we, the seed sharing has mixed up a lot, and like even what I grow on my garden, I grow a lady swinger from Assam and I grow something from Orissa and you know something from Nagaland. So it is, but you know now since that uh, the whole uh, original system is disturbed, what we are doing is just rescue work. Before we lose everything else, before we lose all those fantastic bottle boards entirely, we are just keeping them. It's something like, you know, you would breed in captivity if you, you know, you can't, and then you release it in the wild so that it's at least around, it's surviving. So I don't see our kind of seed saving work as the hope for the future. Ultimately, we, the whole country should become a seed bank again, you know, people should be doing, but in the Himalayas, there are hardly any people now in all the villages, most of the young people have left and gone to cities. I see that everywhere. There are just a few old people there, you know. So that re-engagement, reconnection with the natural world, developing varieties for those situations, you know, that has to happen again. But till that time, there's still a value in uh, this kind of rescue work. And, you know, see, I got a tall lady's finger variety from Assam. It weighs three meters or four meters there or maybe even more. I had no idea it would work here, but I could grow it. Because you know, in a home garden, you, you choose the right season, you have some idea, and you can, home garden varieties, you can manage. But paddy would be different because they are photosensitive, photo period sensitive. So for other things, maybe they are very location specific. But for vegetables, 
uh, within a broad climate type, I can't, of course, grow temperate vegetables. I can grow temperate vegetables, but I can't make them seed. So I can grow cabbages, I've grown cabbage and cauliflower and everything, but I haven't made, uh, succeeded to get them to seed. If you can do that, that uh, that's also another thing I'm, I love working on, uh, because a plant is a living being. And if you can make it to reproduce, you might have a variety which is adapted to that place. So that is a part of the work which I like. And so I grow carrots. I try to make my seeds. I haven't succeeded yet, but it's very really interesting, no? So I let them seed. And I want to see if I can do that. Even if I can do it for two or three varieties, like, you know, I noticed that the Chinese vegetables, like pok choy and Chinese cabbage, they grow very well here, but we should make them seed. And then we can have a variety which is tolerant to this climate and this type. Another example I want to give you is that the orchard cucumber, that uh, Gerard says that that's from Puna Kira. It's a variety from Puna which is totally white, but he has grown it for so many years, 40 years, 45 years, and it is adapted to this place and it's become totally different, unique variety. Sorry? Orchard cucumber. Uh, in fact, some of my, the varieties, I didn't show you those, but the red okra, a red okra, uh, I'm growing the 35th generation of that seed in Pebble Garden, but, uh, and I got it in uh, 1994, and 20 years before that, Charlie was growing it in Orogreen. Oh, yes. So it's been around in Oroville for more than uh, 45 years. So there are some heirlooms, order with heirlooms. <laughs> I hope we can maintain that. <laughs> yeah. So can we talk about uh, uh, another issue that you often bring up, which you didn't bring up today, uh, is our, uh, our, our diet. And, 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 and uh, I know uh, several people talk about this, but I, as an after coming to Orville, I'm noticing that while people like you and Krishna and others talk about local diets and changing going back, I don't see a movement like in Solar Kitchen to do that. So I'm trying to take, I want you to explain a little about it and also figure out a way for us to say, hey, uh, let's bring it, let's bring the demand. So. Uh, in addition to cultivating seeds, you cultivate the stomachs. Yeah. Yes. Um, when I see the solar kitchen, I feel they are trying to make an effort. You know, I see we get a different from solar kitchen. Last year, I broke my foot, so I couldn't uh, go around and cook my food and shop and all that. So we get it different, and I feel there is some kind of an effort to try this and try that, like I see them using the elephant foot yam, uh, they are trying to do something. Uh, change is really not easy, you know, and when you have to cook on a large scale, it's easier if in a home garden, that's why my thing is, I say for home gardens, because you can grow and you can use it, you know, and you know what you like, what your family likes, and it's much more direct and it's in your hands. But when you have to ask somebody a big place to change, uh, there are a whole lot of other links which have to be, uh, you know, taken care of. So it's not difficult, not easy to uh, to tell somebody, you know, do this. You can only suggest. And uh, like even if people start growing things, like I have my own flaws. I mean, I do my seed work and I share it with all over India. Inside Orville, I am not organized to share seeds. It's only those who know me and come to me and ask for seeds that I offer them to them. But I'm not organized because we have, we have just stayed at like what two hands can do. I haven't expanded, we don't have an institution or staff or anything. So there's a limited scope to our work, you know. But I try my best to share seeds with people around and even with villages around. So whenever there's a group, today people came and shared seeds, you know. The next week, three groups are coming. I'll be sharing seeds from the village areas. And somewhere it works with seed sharing. Like from the seed saver's point of view, your job, you grow it and you share the seeds and somewhere it, it's grown and consumed. 
but yeah directly to transform things in uh, you know a place like solar kitchen i would i wouldn't be uh, i would know what to recommend but for home gardens yes you know will i think gardens can really thrive and uh, they can be very productive it's not an easy place also or will the climate is very harsh uh, we have uh, only one good season it's not at all easy and apart from local you have to also focus on perennials perennial plants during summers which will uh, keep you going i see a lot of uh, efforts to do better you know everybody wants to try new things and all that so that's what it is about diet yes uh, the um, you know yeah in a general sense chemically grown food is is not food actually because it is toxic so it fails to nourish us and uh, there's no choice actually we have to but i'm not i'm not one to feel that we ought to go for high tech farming like you know what they are projecting for the future uh, what are those vertical farms with uh, artificial uh, uh, robots and led lights i mean that is in the way uh, we have to move it because it will not uh, we need to be healthy to live for all this cause you know we we have to take care of mother earth and the, the nutrients even the balance of nutrients however much you you know curate a nutrient mix for plants it will never be the same as what all the millions of microorganisms are uh, transforming you know and bringing into our food so from the production side we have to go back to nature and work with her yeah uh, my question is i think partly answered already by you and thank you so much so nurturing and re-inspiring us all to hear your experience. Uh, currently, the current administration of our will puts a lot of emphasis on productivity, increasing our yields and all of that. I've even heard the, um, somebody say that, yeah, we need to bring agro-industry into our own farms. So uh, my question is just how to bridge the gap of communication, how to bring your experience somehow into more into all of it and um, if you could have the ears what would be uh, your suggestion maybe to our administration also to the farmers and to us as the community that are the consumers thank you well i don't feel competent to give advice to anybody uh, i just what i say is what i feel from my experience and you know working in this field it is very hard to uh, give advice to anybody uh, which makes sense but uh, i this emphasize emphasis on yield and productive we need more people who are going to be ready to work it's hard work but you should really enjoy it and it is enjoyable work otherwise why would we do it you know but we need more young people to join and to feel excited about growing things you know you have to feel excited otherwise you would never do it and that's what i whenever i interact with people i want to tell them this is fantastic what you're doing you know just keep going because uh, you will find a way but people are needed and uh, i mean for that you have to be ready to do you have to be ready as he was saying to some peak or you come in the morning and peacocks have eaten everything and then you you kept your seeds the squirrels have eaten everything and then you have to handle the whole thing i mean people like amshun would know because they run a farm no you you're working on it every day you have to keep on doing it no keep on doing it so i think that in order to be more people to get involved and with their full complete immerse uh, immerse themselves in that it's not a thing which you can say now i work for few hours you know I mean, you have to find that should be your complete life. You, know, you can't say no, no for five and a half hours, and that's it. You know, no. <laughs> so I think that in order we we need more people who uh, want to do farming, and then it will work. Then it will work. But uh, I can't really advise any, uh, give any advice. I can only talk about like what I said. You know, I don't think that this industry of farming is going to feed people or nourish people. And what is the use of food if it doesn't nourish you? you know 
And on top of that, if it if it kills you, if it is toxic, that's not food. You can't call that food. And it's been known uh, just from the plant variety point of from the seeds and plant breeding thing. It is a known thing that uh, yield and nutrition are mutually exclusive. If you breed plants for yield, you will have less nutrition and vice versa. And in the past 50 years, all plant breeding has focused only on yield as a result of which nutrition is going down and we can all feel it. And, you know, we can all feel it. You just ask anybody from the village, they know how the ragi was so nourishing. People used to drink uh, cool, you know, fermented cool made with uh, kambu and ragi, just four glasses and they can do the most hard physical labor. There was nourishment in the food, you know, and what is there in the ri rice you get in the ration? So quantity, uh, yield and nutrition are mutually exclusive. And if you focus on yield, you're not going to nourish yourself. Yeah. So I asked this question to Anshul two days ago when we visited the, the farm. Um, in, so in two days I'm going to Thailand, south of Thailand, and I actually just stepped out to ask the person what seed she was interested in. But so I'm going to be there and I'm going to help in the garden. So I'm wondering what are the step and what are the factor to grow the the food with the most to make it most nutrient, the best nutrients. Um, yeah, the steps and what are the factors? That's uh, the question. I, I have the seed that it's in the garden, I plant, and then what are the steps and real factor that's going to make it um, highly nutrient or not? Uh, well, nutrition is on two sides always. Like a plant is a living being and it grows in a living soil. So from both sides, uh, you know, you have to work on both sides. If uh, a there are plants, definitely some varieties, like there are rice varieties in India, which are extremely high in a particular nutrient. You know, by their own, by their very nature, they are high in a certain nutrient. So uh, nutrition comes from both sides, from the plant itself, from the variety itself, and also the soil. I mean, if you grow like a highly, for instance, just to give you a name, there's a black rice in Manipur called Sakhau, highly uh, antioxidant rich. If you grow that on a very poor soil, it isn't going to be able to express its uh, qualities, you know. So you need to, you, you need a good soil for the plant to express its potential. So you have to work on both the soil and the plant. And for organic farming, there's only one rule uh, to nourish your soil, which is have more organic matter. You have to increase the organic matter content in the soil by whichever way, like I told you, we do the leaves, but if people use compost, you know, whatever way, you need to increase organic matter in the soil and you have to have good seed. And you have to know the right season. Because it doesn't work, you have to plant it in the right season. So there's the knowledge of all these things that uh, uh, you will have to develop. Are you taking into account sort of the yeah, I know there's the Ayurvedic style of, of doing garden or the astrological um, astrological influence. Are you taking those two factors or others like bio, um, biodynamic and I guess you know the five elements uh, into consideration? Well, um, I don't practice biodynamic farming, but uh, I think that it does influence plant growth. Uh, I have never been able to follow the moon cycles uh, because of the way in which we work. Like, uh, I mean, we are just two of us and uh, if I'm ready to plant today, I plant today. I can't wait for another and our season is so short. We have such a short time for planting after the monsoon. You know, it can sometimes we can have a cyclone at the end of December and then uh, within like a fortnight you have to plant everything. Otherwise, it will become very hot in February. So you you can't, you don't have time to wait for the next cycle. And that is a constraint in this, in our, in order way, uh, to follow those cycles. But I do believe it has an influence. Uh, if I had the possibility, like if we were in like some other part of India, like Gujarat or Maharashtra, anywhere where there's a long season, or say Bangalore, which is mild throughout, 
then you can, you know, you can try all this and you will see the result. But here I don't think you can wait for that. Yeah. Thank you. So that that thing is there. So it helps you 
have a group of some like-minded people together so that you have company and at least you agree on certain things and you can support each other uh, morally and in every way. Uh, but even if you are, from the technical point of view, even if you are supported, you are surrounded by chemical farmers, that's going to influence your thing. But still, that won't stop you from doing what you want to do. You can still do it. I mean, you will be bothered. The chemical residues will come into the soil. We can't cut ourselves off from the environment. You know, now I live in a, there's no agriculture around our place. But you know, there is a stingless bee, the trigona. Last year there was a complete extermination of trigona. It's a wild bee. There's not a single bee around. I have no idea. There are no chemicals used around. There's nothing. I don't know what is the reason. So how do you say? Have you noticed that in any? There are no trigona bees. And I asked a friend from the ashram who keeps bees last year. Uh, do you did you have? I had twenty colonies around my house. Everywhere, if I keep a mattress rolled up on outside for like ten days, there'll be trigona inside. You know, they were just spreading everywhere. And all of them are gone. And that's a very scary thing because Dragona is a wild bee, which is the, one of the most prolific pollinators in this area. The Indian honeybee, Apisirana, it forages m much less, the range of plants it forages is much less than Dragona. Dragona goes to so many wild plants, your avocados. So a uh, fall in uh, this dragona, uh, uh, collapse of dragona will affect uh, avocado. We won't have avocados, or we'll have much less. Did you notice that? So it's, it's going to happen. So we really can't create that. It has to be, so start wherever you are and do whatever you can, I would say. Just be practical and do what you can. It's very difficult. Same thing with the water situation. We, we do so much to have ponds for harvesting water. And still, in spite of that, the water level is not showing anything. And even though, I saw some figures like, the even though it rains a lot, that the water level doesn't come up because it's being exploited, it's being pumped out. So what can you do about that? You doesn't stop you from harvesting, you still do your pond, you still plant trees, you still, you know, do what you have to do. So, uh, so the amount of land in such an unfavorable is community to the surroundings, like, so Prayo Parivar, as you mentioned, that they have that answers in those books, I guess, uh, in, like half acre, one acre, what is the land that you have to kind of buffer yourself from these effects from other farms or like uh, they, That was not what they focused on, uh, this kind of thing. They just said, like, they were, it was a design. <coughs> And I hadn't seen, although I did travel to Ten Gunta farms, I didn't see any actual functional model. It was, it was an idea, a concept. I didn't see it in practice, except one time in Deepak Sajdeh's place. But you also have to think of growing the biomass, no? Yes. So you have Ten Gunta, you can grow your crops. What about all the organic matter that you're going to need for that, you know? If you're going to have cows or something, then where are you going to feed them from? Because, you know, organic farming, if you do it and if you just get inputs from somewhere else, what sense does that make? You know, it's like I heard that in Netherlands they do very fine organic farming, uh, vegetable growing, but they get all the organic matter from Sri Lanka or India and compressed uh, things. So that doesn't make, that's not organic farming really, according to me, you know. I mean, it's not uh, ecological farming. Maybe organic, but it's taking input from somewhere else, no? Yeah. So you have to count all that. And I don't know if anyone has done that calculation of how much land you would need if you have to grow all the biomass. That depends on the fertility of the land, the seasons. You can't have one model for every place. So it's like 0.25 per plus whatever is needed to. Yes, you will have to calculate that. But a quarter acre is a lot of land to grow vegetables. Yes. And if you if you diversify, that's why exploring diversity is really critical to increasing productivity of a farm. You know, because vegetables not just like uh, uh, beans and carrots and cauliflower. There's so many other things. You like all those tubers. The, I I told you about those tubers. They can you can produce 35 kilos from one plant. 
and these all traditional tubers will grow very hardy. They, they have rain fed. They will come with the rain and go with the rain, like finish with the rain. Uh, but you have to learn how to cook that. You have to learn how to develop a taste for it. So, <laughs> you know, then it will work. But and perennial plants, you have to learn to use them. I do grow it, but even I'm not good at cooking them. You know, many times. So you have to learn how to do it. We have so many like this. Uh, there is this sauropus. It's such a good thing, but we haven't kind of things like that could be easily introduced in solar kitchen. You know, perennial plants like more drumstick leaf. If those kind of things have more drumstick leaf or have this uh, sauropus, those are easy to grow. No, very easy to grow. That would be easy to suggest to them. And the, the Mayan spinach also will grow anywhere. That giant spinach, you put the stick in yeah. the ground, it will grow anywhere. Yes. The only place that really uses it is uh, sod in the forest. They put it in everything yes. because it's growing. Anybody can grow it. Yes. And uh, you can have a hedge around your house. You'll never have a food security issue. Yeah. And it's very nutritious. You just have to cook it. Yes. And then we have sweet leaf. We have all these things, you know. Sweet leaf is multivitamin. Yes. It has everything. You stick it in the ground, it yeah, grows. Yes, just yes. needs a little water. Absolutely. So there's so many of these plants that really want to grow. Yes. And they're, if you get a handful of them in your garden, a tulsi grows like a weed. Yeah. You have all of that. You have your tea, you have your veggies, you have your sprinkles on your other food. Uh, it, it, it's just all, uh, it's not that difficult. And we have people here, you know, we have the you know, we have all these people who are doing these things yeah. and the ed so-called edible weeds, you know. Yeah. I mean, they're growing all over our gardens yeah. and people pull them out to put in other things that are less nutritious and need all kinds of work. Yeah. So it is, your kind of knowledge is fantastically needed, you know, to, to do all these things and mm -hmm. Nina's work with the, with the edible weeds. We, but, but see, people are not so motivated. As you said, you know, sort of kitchen, all these places, people, you know, things are going to have to get worse. And they will. So yeah. uh, look forward to uh, <laughs> more local work because the world is changing fast. Yeah. And we're going to have to. What you're doing is, uh, for me, pioneering where we're going to go in the future. We're not going back to the old-fashioned, back to the land, primitive, like you said. This guy throws 54 seeds, he's got a sustainable system. Yeah. So permaculture, all these things uh, are the future. And so your future seeds. And thank you so much for, you know, coming here and giving your first presentation <laughs> in virtual <laughs> to the community after 29 years. Which we, we really appreciate that. And uh, I think we better wind up because we're, um, it, it's getting late, but if anybody, uh, you know, you're here for a few minutes, if anybody wants to say something or ask her some questions. And Chilpa always gets the last word. She will tell you something. Thank you so much, dear Deepika, for really, I mean, for such an in, in, insightful hearing. It's really I mean, amazing to hear about it. And before taking much time, I'll just make a small announcement for our next talk, which is on 18th of February. That is by Asta Satil, and uh, she will be talking about growing up with a mother. That is also, again, going to be a very interesting talk. So I welcome you all for that, and hope to see you. And before we close today's I mean, talk, I really thank Deepika from Bharat Yavar, and from so all much. of us for being with us. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before you go, if you like to pick up some seeds, you're welcome. No. no. And uh, this uh, little pamphlet is also there for you. Thank you. Thank you.